Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rocket summary of all the latest regarding SpaceX Starship development, all the rocket launches we saw over the past seven days, all the launches we've got to look forward to over the coming seven days, and of course, all the best and most interesting historic spaceflight anniversaries that are going to be taking place over the course of this week. So, with intros and salutations out of the way, let's get right on to our first segment, taking a look at all the developments with SpaceX's Starship that we saw over the past seven days. Work continues at Boca Chica Starbase at the reliably rapid rate SpaceX have been flying at for the past few months now. While we're no longer seeing the regular number of flights that we were treated to at the beginning of the year, this downtime will have an immense payoff very soon as all of the work that SpaceX are doing right now is centered on getting the launch site ready to support an orbital launch of a Starship vehicle. The launch integration tower, which will be used to lift the Starship vehicle on top of the Super Heavy, as well as eventually serve as the catch system for the first stage, so that heavy landing legs like the Falcon 9s aren't required, has had its seventh module installed, and so now it's only got one more segment to go before it's at full height, and the little launch platform next to it is approaching completion as well. After this, all the superficial work, such as plumbing and wiring, will take hopefully relatively little time to install, and then it's on to putting the infrastructure to use with the launch of SN20 and Booster 4, which SpaceX hoped to launch at some point in either July or August. We did see the rollout of Booster Number 3 to Suborbital Test Stand A after stacking and fabrication was completed last week. We've been watching this booster's construction very excitedly, as this is and was the vehicle that will fly to orbit. Or so we thought. Actually, this has been confirmed to be a production prototype now, much like BN1, and won't be going anywhere, at least under its own propulsion. <laughs> It'll undergo some ground tests though, most likely proofing and cryoproofing, similar to the prototype BN2.1, ahead of Booster 4, which Elon has confirmed on Twitter will be the first one to fly, and if they still hope to launch to orbit in the next month or two, then it's basically confirmed that this vehicle will be the one to carry Starship SN20. The first segments of this vehicle have been spotted, and will soon begin stacking inside the high bay. On the subject of SN20, how is the old girl doing? It feels like SpaceX were producing whole starships in just mere days earlier this year for SN8-15, to so why is it suddenly taking so long for SN20? Well, there are a number of reasons why SN20, the first orbital class starship, is likely taking a little bit longer than the previous flight test vehicles. Firstly, SpaceX are focusing their efforts on the ground infrastructure to support the launch itself, with a slightly lower priority on the starship. Secondly, and I suspect chiefly, SN20 marks the biggest major technology revolution since SN15 and since it's aiming for orbital height rather than a measly 10 kilometers, it's going to need to fly a lot higher, a lot faster and most importantly of all, be capable of surviving re-entry speeds which are as high as Mach 25 and will necessitate a full heat shield across the entire side of the ship and then it'll need to perform a flip and landing burn to touch down or I guess splashdown in one piece. While SpaceX, according to Elon on Twitter, are confident that the vehicle will reach orbit okay, the Starship orbital campaign will probably require many flight attempts to survive re-entry and pull off the landing as well. But they've already proven they can land these gigantic rockets, so I'm confident that they'll pull this off even if SN20 itself doesn't quite fulfill every objective of this extremely daunting mission. And if SN20 doesn't nail it, then no matter, as production of SN21 has already begun. As you can see from Brendan Lewis's latest production diagram, fans have spotted a piece of this vehicle. Though don't forget, these diagrams, and in fact our general knowledge of Starship as a whole, comes from basically just snooping around Starbase and snapping pictures of what's there. The nose cones for SN20, 21, and even beyond may very well exist somewhere. Adrian Aguila caught this shot of what looks like five nose cones inside one of the tents. These may well be assigned to different starships, but we just can't confirm that at this stage. The rollout of BN3 was really the highlight of Starship news this week in my opinion, and it'll be very exciting to see this monster of a rocket undergo its testing, even if it doesn't actually get off the ground. I expect there'll be lots to discuss in next Monday's Space this week, and for now, I'm wrapping up this week's summary there. Let's take a look then at what else we saw last week. 
Last week saw a handful of launches. The first was on the 29th of June and was a Soyuz 2.1A, which launched Progress MS-17 from the Baikonur Cosmodrome to the International Space Station. This was the 169th flight of a Progress spacecraft and it docked with the International Space Station two days after launch, where it will now remain attached until November. The next launch of the week was on the 30th of June and was Virgin Orbit's Air Launch to Launcher 1 vehicle. This was the third flight of the rocket, the second successful flight of it, and the first commercial mission for it. On this mission, dubbed Tubular Bells Part 1, named after the first song produced by Virgin Records, the rocket placed seven CubeSats into orbit, four of which were for the US Department of Defense's space test program, one of them was the first military satellite launched for the Royal Netherlands Air Force, and two of them were Earth observation satellites for Polish firm Sat Revolution, who plan to eventually have 14 of these Earth observation satellites in orbit. The third launch we saw last week was SpaceX's Transporter 2 mission, the company's second dedicated rideshare mission. This was planned to launch on the 29th of June, but it had to be delayed because a helicopter decided to fly into the no-fly zone during the launch window, so the launch was pushed back to the 30th. Luckily, the second attempt went well without any surprise helicopters, and the Falcon 9 successfully placed 88 satellites into low Earth orbit, and the first stage successfully returned to the launch site and landed on the pad at landing zone 1. Among the satellites deployed is QMR KWT, an education satellite which is the first ever satellite from Kuwait. Congratulations to all involved for this launch. Next up, on the 1st of July, we saw a Soyuz 2.1b launch from the Vostochny Cosmodrome, carrying the latest batch of 36 communication satellites for the OneWeb satellite constellation. The success of this mission brings the total number of operational satellites in the constellation to a clean 248. Very nice. On the 3rd of July, China launched a Long March 2D, which carried three Earth observation satellites to low Earth orbit. One was for Chinese space company Chengdu Guozing Aerospace Technology Company Limited, while the other two were for the Chinese Academy of Sciences. All three were successfully deployed and are now operational in orbit. The final orbital flight of the week was on the 4th of July and was a Chinese Long March 4C, which deployed a meteorology satellite into low Earth orbit. I think. Actually, I'm not sure, as this launch took place on Sunday night after I finished editing this video, so I can't be too sure on this if it did or did not happen, only including it here because, you know, I'm always the optimist. But you may want to fact check this one yourself, or see if I remember to pin a comment in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, do remember to please like the video, it really helps to support the channel for the low price of nothing, and it's always greatly appreciated. Now, last week we also had a suborbital launch. This was the Momo Rocket Flight 7, which is a sounding rocket from Japan that launched an infrasound sensor for atmospheric research on behalf of the Kochi University of Technology. Finally, it is worth noting that the Shenzhou 12 crew members Leo Boming and Tang Hongbo conducted the first Chinese spacewalk since 2008 on the Tiangong space station to install various equipment. And that's it for my summary of what we saw last week, so now let's take a look at what we can expect to see this week. The most noteworthy flight this week will be the suborbital launch of Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 VSS Unity, which will launch from its carrier aircraft in the skies above New Mexico on a trajectory that will take it just out of the atmosphere, giving its crew spectacular views of the Earth in zero-g. The crew consists of pilots David McKay and Michael Masucci, and four passengers Sarisha Bandler, Colin Bennett, Beth Moses and Sir Richard Branson. That last name should sound familiar, he's the billionaire founder of the Virgin Group and this flight will be a very noticeable 9 days before New Shepard Launch 16, which will carry Jeff Bezos, Jeff who? Jeff who? the founder of Blue Origin, into suborbital space. So rich they're flexing hard. <laughs> this week will also host some orbital flights. The first will be on the 7th of July, which will be a Chinese Long March 3C, which will place a Tianlian communication satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. Following this, there'll be another launch from China on the 9th of July, this time a Long March 6, which will carry five Ningxia Earth observation satellites to low Earth orbit. Not stopping there, there'll then be another Chinese launch on the 10th of July, this time a Hyperbola 1 rocket, which will launch an unknown payload into low Earth orbit. And those are all the launches that we're expecting to see this week, which therefore means we can segue to our final segment now, all the most interesting spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. 
The first anniversary of the week takes place on the 5th of July in 1687. It was on this momentous day that Isaac Newton published Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which today is often simply referred to as the Principia. It's a work of three books and is perhaps one of, if not the most important scientific texts ever published. Within its pages are Newton's Laws of Motion, which paved the foundation for classical mechanics, Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, and a derivation of Johannes Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. I am massively oversimplifying this monumental piece of text, since translating the complicated mathematical theories contained within its pages is a bit beyond the scope of both this show and, quite frankly, my communication abilities. But we have this work to thank for all of the amazing stuff that we're able to cover every single week on this channel. Also on the 5th of July, this time a bit more recently in 2016, the Juno space probe arrived at Jupiter. The Juno probe's primary objectives are to help improve our understanding of the solar system's beginnings by unlocking the origin and evolution of its largest planet, Jupiter. Specifically, Juno measures the amount of water inside Jupiter's dense atmosphere to help determine which planet formulation theory is correct, look deep into Jupiter's atmosphere to measure various things such as its chemical composition, temperature and cloud motions, observe and map Jupiter's magnetic fields to find out more about the planet's deep inner structure, and explore and study Jupiter's poles, particularly the auroras in the magnetosphere. Juno was originally planned to be deorbited into Jupiter in July 2021, but so far the mission has received two mission extensions, with activities now set to continue until at least September 2025. On the 6th of July, the Mars Pathfinder rover, the Sojourner, rolled off the landing module and onto the Martian surface becoming the first roving robot to ever traverse the surface of Mars. I don't want to drag this anniversary on for too long since I already talked about the Mars Pathfinder mission in last week's history segment, but I'll be darned if I won't take any opportunity I can to showcase this adorable footage of this little rover going off on its adventure. Speaking of Mars rovers, on the 8th of July in 2003, a Delta II-H launched the Opportunity rover towards Mars. This little guy would touch down in the Meridiani Planum in January 2004, three weeks after its twin rover, Spirit, touched down on the other side of the planet. Opportunity's mission was originally planned to be approximately 90 Earth days long, but we definitely got some good mileage in the end, as the rover would, in fact, remain active all the way until 2018. Its twin, Spirit, unfortunately got stuck in 2009, eventually losing communications in 2010 after the orientation of its solar panels meant it couldn't get adequate sunlight to recharge its batteries. Opportunity would eventually meet its maker when it succumbed to the massive dust storms on Mars in 2018, and the rover's final communication with NASA was on the 10th of June 2018, after travelling a total distance of 45.16 kilometres on Mars. NASA did hope that communications could be restarted once the atmosphere cleared, but sadly they did not, either because of some failure in Opportunity systems or due to the dust occluding its solar panels. The mission was declared officially over in February 2019. On the 8th of July in 2011, Space Shuttle Atlantis launched on mission STS-135, which would not only be its final ever flight, but would also be the last shuttle launch ever. The Atlantis delivered supplies and equipment to the International Space Station and was crewed by just four astronauts, compared to the usual six or seven. This was because if the shuttle were to be damaged on launch, such that re-entry would not be possible, there were no other space shuttles left that would have been able to rescue the crew. Therefore, for STS-135, the crew numbers were reduced to four, so that if this event were to happen, the crew could seek refuge on the International Space Station and return to Earth one at a time over the course of about a year on Russian Soyuz capsules. All the STS-135 crew members launched with Russian Sokol spacesuits and Soyuz seat liners in case this happened, but luckily none of this was needed and the shuttle was able to re-enter and land safely, with final touchdown taking place 12 days after the launch on the 21st of July. The final anniversary of the week takes place on the 10th of July, when in 19. 62, a Thor Delta rocket launched the Telstar 1, which would be the first ever active communication satellite in orbit and the first commercial payload in space. Two days after launch, it relayed the world's first transatlantic television signal. While
While it only operated for seven months, far shorter than modern satellites last, it was nonetheless a groundbreaking achievement for the US in the space race, and over its life it carried over 400 telephone, telegraph, facsimile, and television transmissions before its onboard electronics succumbed to the effects of radiation and failed. While it's been inactive now for nearly 60 years, the satellite remains in Earth orbit to this day. And it's also the final anniversary I wanted to discuss this week, which therefore brings an end to this week's historical anniversary coverage segment. And that's a wrap on another episode of Space This Week. It has certainly been quite the week to live through. We had some amazing launches from the Launcher 1 to the Transporter 2. And of course, Soyuz is always fun to watch. And of course, it's been fun trying to keep up with SpaceX's Starship development as things come together at such a rapid rate. That super heavy flight, I can smell it on the horizon. Guys, thank you so much for watching Space This Week. If you want to join the names listed on screen, you can do so by joining my Patreon via the on-screen link or via the link in the description. You you can also join the channel by clicking the join button below the video, get some cool emojis and get a badge next to your name. There are two more videos on screen, both on my channel, both I think you'll enjoy immensely, but that of course is up to you. Thank you once again for watching Space this week and I will see you in the next one.